This is Dan Schneider. On this Dan Schneider video interview, the topic is comic strips, the history of this unique American art form, and I have two experts that will talk about it, and the conversation will begin in a moment. The subject is comic strips. I have two experts on the medium. On the left is John Lent. On the right is Neil Cohn. As I usually like to do, I give people a few minutes to introduce themselves, their background on the topic. So welcome to both. And John, if you could go first and just give me a little bit of background about who you are, what your interests in comics are, and any books you may have written. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm John A. Lent. I taught for 51 years at various universities in the United States, Philippines, Malaysia, China. Um, and uh, my interest in comics goes back to my childhood, my father was an avid reader of the newspaper strips, and I was also reading them when he was. My research in this area started about 30 or 40 years ago, uh, and uh, since that time I've uh, expanded it. Most of my research has been on Asia and other parts of the world, but some on the United States too. I've written many books on uh, comics. I've written a book that just came out last year called Asian Comics. Uh, I'm working on one on Asian political cartoons. I've done one on uh, Chinese cartoons and animation. That's due out soon. And uh, a number of others. And, uh, in 1999, I started the International Journal of Comic Art, which is published out of this house. Everything except the printing and binding is done in this house. So these are my interests. I serve on comics and uh, uh, animation juries around the world and give talks at various places. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, Neil, if I could ask the same of you, and you have a website as well, so if you could give a little background about yourself. Sure. Um, my name is Neil Cohn. I'm an assistant professor at the Tilburg Center for Cognition and Communication at Tilburg University in the Netherlands. Uh, I am American. I'm from Southern California originally. Uh, I had been drawing comics since I was a child and uh, started studying uh, comics in college, I would say. Uh, and my primary interest is in the cognition of sequential images and visual narratives uh, and visual communication. So uh, I primarily study how it is in people's minds and brains. And Understand sequences of images, uh, and so my primary research is in uh, linguistics and cognitive science, cognitive neuroscience. Uh, I have written uh, several books. Uh, in addition to drawing several comics, uh, I uh, uh, my main monograph is the visual language of comics, which came out in 2013. Uh, this year, I edited uh, a uh, uh, compilation uh, book called The Visual Narrative Reader, uh, which came out in January. Uh, and I have a website that is visuallanguagelab.com. Well, uh, before I, I get to the history of uh, uh, and the background coming up to comics, I've done a couple of other shows where I talk mo uh, mainly about comic books. And uh, the thing about comic strips versus comic books is it's sort of like, to me, comparing poetry versus prose. Um, the comic strips being more like poetry that you get three or four panels and you, you get uh, sometimes even a unique world within the world of the comic strip itself, a, a unique moment. Uh, and I've, I've never been a big comic book fan, but I've much preferred comic strips because of that element. Um, let me ask both of you just a general broad question then. Uh, do you think that the sequential art of the panel, uh, uh, you know, uh, three or four panels is somehow more pungent uh, and that something is lost perhaps in the longer form uh, or, or do you see them as basically the same? Uh, John, if you want to go first. No, I, I see them as uh, different. I also think that uh, uh, for me, the, uh, the three or four panel is, is, uh, is more effective. Uh, you're getting the, the whole story uh, and sometimes a cliffhanger at the end in three or four panels and I, I think to be able to do that is genius work so yes I, I think that something may be lost when we stretch it out further how about you Neil 
Uh, I think it's, I wouldn't say something is gained or lost. Uh, I think there's a trade off that happens. So when you have a smaller format, uh, you have a smaller format within which you can do certain things. So if you look at the like structure of, say, short form strips versus long form books, uh, I think you end up seeing that in long form uh, things, you end up getting sometimes a richer structure uh, that ends up coming out with more complex. Uh, pacing and narrative and things like that, simply because you have more space in order to let that narrative breathe. Now, that space might not be preferred because you also might want to convey something that's very concise uh, and uh, uh, poignant and to the point, uh, which is would be much more what you'd be able to do in a short strip because you have much more compact space to pack in that information. So you're not afforded as much space to use, and thus you have to make your point much, uh, much more succinctly. Well, uh, let me uh, go to the history of the art form, because comic strips, uh, along with jazz, rock and roll, and baseball, are considered amongst the more unique American inventions. Yet, John, uh, I, I, I've never been a big uh, manga fan, but uh, does manga predate comic strips uh, here in the U.S.? And if so, does that sort of invalidate the claim that comic strips are an American art form? Um, it, it's always a, a matter of how you define the comic strips and the comic books, and people define them very differently. But certainly in Japan, there were uh, the equivalencies of, of comic books and comic strips before the 1890s. Uh, actually, there were kibyoshi back in the late 1700s in Japan that uh, could be considered a type of comic book. But I think not just in Japan, there were also uh, predecessors of the American comic strip in, in parts of Europe, too. Uh, certainly with Topher and, uh, and uh, some of the work of Doré and, and uh, these people in France. Uh, uh, Bush in uh, Germany, uh, they were doing something equivalent to the comic strip. Um, How about you, Neil? What, what Do you consider manga a predecessor to uh, the comic strip or comic book form? Well, I think, uh, I mean, John is much more the expert on the historical things than I am, but I think uh, you have to ask what you mean by uh, comic strip and what that format means. So if you're talking about the conveying of information via sequential images, well, that is owned by no country and no uh, region because that's simply a uh, basic human ability that we've had for millennia uh, that is not tied to any particular context like comics or manga or something like that. Um, now, if you're talking about the particular sociocultural context of comics that we know today, uh, then as John said, that there's many origins to that in various places throughout the world. Uh, in Europe, the things that kind of foreshadowed and kind of were precursors to the development of what are now known as uh, comic strips, as uh, prominently in America and also prominently in other places of the world as well. Um, in the case of Japan, uh, you did see these kind of uh, aspects of uh, sequential images and image uh, text pairings, certainly going back centuries, but they uh, had a resurgence in formatting, certainly in the late 1800s and early 1900s, that, that imitated uh, American and Western comics. So uh, it wasn't like uh, there's a solely, you know, one driving force that then influences everybody else. It's lots of different places that are influencing each other uh, because it's, it's more of a network than, than a tree, I would say. Yeah, I recently read a book on Pulitzer Hearst and sort of the tabloid wars of 1890s New York. And the term yellow journalism uh, even comes from an early comic strip, The Yellow Kid. Uh, did comic strips evolve out of, say, the Thomas Nast tradition of uh, op-ed cartooning? Did, did the comic strips come out of? Yeah, the Thomas Nast editorial cartooning kind of thing. came out of Thomas Nast's uh, uh, type of work. Uh, no. That was completely different. Those were definitely political cartoons and uh, usually one panel. 
I, I don't think I don't think that no. that would be uh, considered a predecessor of the comic strips. Well, were comic strips uh, initially political? Yeah, yeah, of course. But uh, you know, it, again, it's a definition thing because uh, if you think of panels, the Yellow Kid did not start out as a panel strip. It was it was a huge panel. In fact, the earliest ones took up the full page with a lot of text on them, usually on the left side. Um, so, you know, it's uh, it, it's that definition again. But what was your second point or question? Well, I was just wondering uh, if did the comic strips initially, like the Yellow Kid, uh, did they initially start out with political slants or were they definitively humorous, hence the name comic strip? I think there was some political and social satire in them. Uh, the messages that were on the shirt of the yellow kid, the background images, uh, the signs on the buildings, uh, the, the name of the strip, you know, they're different. One was a strip that was a, a, at a political rally or something to that effect, uh, turmoil. So yes, the, it was there, but it was not the dominant theme in the, in the Yellow Kid. Neil, and then the comic yeah. strips, you know, since that time, there have been a lot of social and political messages. Yeah. Uh, we, we think about uh, uh, Doonesbury, but uh, there are many others too that have these messages, different types of messages. Neil, I mean, Percy Crosby, for instance, with his strip, I mean, he became so political that he eventually uh, lost his strip and lost everything that he had because it was all very polemical. This is the 1930s or so. Uh, Neil, your comments? Yeah, um, uh, I think that also, in addition to that, uh, we might say that, that you know, after the Yellow Kid and whatnot, there were certainly political uh, statements, but also before. So many of the uh, people who John mentioned of kind of antecedents to comics uh, were also making very political statements, oftentimes from uh, the uh, kind of the European uh, broadsheets and even the Kibiyoshi in Japan were also uh, very political, oftentimes, which is partially why they went away because uh, the people who were funding and reading them were also the people who were being criticized, and they didn't really like that so much. So um, uh, the, the same sorts of uh, the topics were, you know, what were being written about or drawn about uh, across cultures, even prior to the time that we would think about things as being called comics necessarily. Well, is there in the, in the early part of the uh, 20th century, uh, many of those strips today would be considered uh, politically incorrect. Uh, they were very ethnically oriented. And, uh, you know, they weren't just strips calling blacks coons and things of that sort, but there were ones that were aimed at the Italians, there were others that aimed at the Jews. Uh, so there were different uh, ethnic groups. And when we criticize that today, uh, I, I think we have to remember that some of that was part of the assimilation process at that time. And, uh, and I, I think that you know, it had to go through that process of, of you know, for instance, uh, Happy Hooligan. You know, that, that was a slant at the uh, the Irish. All, almost all of them at that time were certainly socially and politically oriented. Um, every medium, uh, every art has people who are considered innovators. Is there any definitive uh, one or two or three uh, comic strip artists early on that maybe set the three or four panel standard or then maybe broke through and had, you know, a character halfway in one panel, halfway in another. Who are some of the early innovators? I know that like something like Little Nemo and Slumberland did a lot about a decade or so on from the 1890s, but were there any predecessors? the same time as Little Nemo, there were there were certainly others that were starting up that, uh, uh, you know, were, were setting standards and were doing excellent work. 
we don't know today about George McManus, but George McManus, for 50 some years through bringing up father, this strip had a lot of impact throughout the world. The Japanese uh, certainly were using and translating it into Japanese, but it was also used in Southeast Asia and many other places. And if you're seeing George McManus's work, this, this was genius. The, the man should have been an architect. He, he, he could design the interior of buildings. He could show the, uh, you know, the uh, skyscape of, of, the, of New York City. Uh, it was very detailed, very artistic. And then you had others too that added things, uh, you know, that, that uh, I think brought down, well, in, up to a point they were used, but I think now with the minimalist comic strips that we have, you don't have time or space to put any of that in. Let me just show you one that I pulled out here. I don't know if you can see this or not. Mm -hmm. This is a full page. Can you see it? Yeah, you can see it. You can't see the details, but you can see how large it is. Oh, yeah. That's two comic strips. Jungle yeah. Jim and Flash Gordon. Yeah. This is how huge they were at that time. Yeah. And so they, were, they had space to do a lot of artistic detail and, and to put in a lot, of, you know, more uh, uh, dialogue. This mm. is missing today. Most of it is minimalist today. Yeah. I mean, you and I could probably draw uh, Dilbert. You know, or make a good attempt at it. Hmm. So. Uh, Neil, comment? No, I'll add to that is on that point that uh, this is another nice example of this sort of trade off that happens in formatting. So you can talk about the difference between, say, a strip and a book format in sequential images, where a book format allows you to have more panels and thus you're able to do more things in the sequencing. Uh, but if you also have more space to use of the limited number of panels that you have, you're able to do a lot more in those panels because they're going to be much larger, as opposed to if you only have a tiny little you know, strip that's four panels long. Even if those four panels are you know, this big, you're not going to be able to squeeze in as much details and as much you know, richness as you would if those four panels are you know, much, much larger because you simply don't have the space to have that much detail. So in a lot of ways, the formatting certainly does seem to influence how one might structure the, the, the strip itself. What was the and printing technology. Yeah. What was the first color strip? Because Sunday Sunday comics, even when I was a boy, I was born in 1965, even in the early 70s, it was always fun to wait for Sunday because the, the strips would go from, you know, three or four panels to 15 maybe, and then you they would be in color and be maybe a full page. Um, what was the first color strip, and what innovations did that add to the medium? Well, the Yellow Kid was uh, in color, uh, so I would say that probably of the American uh, strips, it would be Yellow Kid. Uh, I grew up in the early 1940s, and, and, uh, well, through the 40s, and at that time, the Sunday supplements were, were always in color. All of the comic strips were, and they were still quite large, and they were very popular. Uh, we waited for that. Living in a small town as I did, this was one of the biggest entertainments. It sounds so ridiculous now, but it was one of the, this is, you know, before television. Uh, this is when we sat in a living room in the dark and listened to the radio at night and the uh, you know, the Sunday comics were, were a big feature, mm. partly because they were in color, but also because they were expanded. Neil, do you have any comment on the color aspect? Uh, on the color, well, certainly color allows you to do certain things that just black and white does not. Um, now, there are a lot of comics worldwide that don't use color at all. So in Jap most Japanese comics, for example, in manga, you don't see color used except for maybe in the first couple pages in certain collections, but uh, those are usually reserved for the very popular ones. Uh, you don't see like full color manga hardly at all. Uh, that does hasn't seem to hurt them in any of the formatting and, or the sales certainly because uh, they outsell everybody else around the world. Um, but in the case of comic strips, certainly you're able to do a lot more rich things. 
yes. Sunday strip suddenly became really very rich because of the way he used a lot of the colors and he would do many more things beyond than what just like, well, let's just make the sky blue and this character has a yellow shirt and this mm -hmm. character has a red shirt. Yeah, his, his whole... He would actually do something. Yeah, his whole Spaceman yeah. Spiff adventures of uh, uh, Calvin. Um, let me, yeah. we, you had mentioned about, uh, it was mentioned that uh, some of the early strips were mostly ethnically based, uh, whether it was, uh, you know, I guess you call it now ethnic kind of humor. Uh, Cats and Jamma Kids was maybe the most popular that I can think of. Um, but then uh, around World War I era, to me, one of my all-time favorite strips, and I think one of the great existential ones was Crazy Cat. Uh, did was that the kind of, of strip? Was there any pre predecessors to Crazy Cat that had that sort of almost you could call now postmodern, but fifty years before postmodernism kind of element? Because that seems to have been come out, as far as I know, out of nowhere, out of the stew of the Cats and Jamma Kids and all of these sort of more predictable ethnic comics. Uh, talk if you either you could talk about Crazy Cat and its impact on the medium. Uh, Either one of you want to go? Yeah. Uh, well, I think, again, John's probably much more of an expert on this than I am. Uh, certainly, I know that uh, Crazy Cat was doing things uh, that have, you know, are very eloquent and interesting, both in the images and in the text, that there's some quite um, eloquent, uh, eloquent, eloquent uh, dialogue and uh, text elements as well. Uh, but uh, there's a really nice uh, discussion of that in some work by Hannah Mia Drag. Uh, certainly that she talks about the kind of eloquence of the text and how that's often overlooked uh, in uh, talking about comics is actually making the words quite eloquent in addition to the images. Uh, and I believe that her, one of her main examples was Crazy Cat. So uh, it certainly has a lot of richness in its structure. Uh, I think John will be able to tell you a little more about the historical significance and uh, maybe sociocultural impact of those things. John? said that the dialogue was certainly different. The, the uh, panel structure or lack of panels was uh, was very different from uh, the predecessors and even those after uh, Crazy Cat. Um, and uh, the color, the color was, a, a, I thought, a more subdued type of color than you normally find in com comics. Uh, so, uh, but the, the, the thing is that even though Crazy Cat comes down as one of the classics, at the time it was only syndicated by 30-some newspapers. Yeah. So it was a type of comic strip that probably was going over the head, heads of uh, many Americans, or Amer many Americans didn't want to take the time to try to figure out uh, sequencing the panels and things of that sort. I don't know the reason, but it seemed strange that it had such a small... Uh, popular impact. Um, the 1920s seems to have been when, uh, just as a, a layman, that a comic strip sort of uh, branched off into many different uh, styles. I mean, you had more uh, things, I think, like Little Off and Annie started then. You had, uh, I think, Blondie started then, I believe. Um, uh, you had I guess more serial strips that were actually telling continuing stories that sort of the, the visual equivalents of what are now known as soap operas. Uh, I, I don't, I don't know if little Abner started back then, but, uh, what were the 1920s sort of a pivotal era in the history of comics, at least in the U S I would think the 1930s were yeah. because Bondi started in the early thirties. So the little Abner, okay. um, Alex Raymond, uh, these people all started, in, they brought in a new dimension, Chester Gold with Dick Tracy and the detective type of comic. Uh, these are products of the 1930s. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, there were others that came in in the 20s that said, uh, you know, took it away from strictly humor. But as for adventure, uh, out of space with Buck Rogers, you know, the domestic family, Blondie, uh, the, you know, uh, kill people with, with Lil Abner. These are 1930s strips. They may have had some genesis in the 20s, but they really were in the 30s. 
Were they a form of escapism? Pardon? Were they a form of escapism, do you think, with the Great Depression? Because you would have, you know, going off with Flash Gordon or Buck Rogers, or you'd be chasing these weird criminals with Dick Tracy? Yeah, could be. It, it certainly could be. That would be an interesting study to do, to see if you could determine that. Neil? We certainly, we used them in, in the 40s as escape, you know, it was taking us away from the tail end of the Depression and also taking us uh, for a few minutes away from World War II. You know, so certainly was an escape yeah. for many people. I also think that, uh, and again, I'm not a historian with regard to this thing, these things, but certainly as the of uh, medium and the uh, people recognizing the ability to do things with sequential images uh, was kind of being consolidated, you might say, in the early part of the 20th century. By the late 20s and 30s, people probably had already established at least some basis of that this is something you can do things with that is beyond maybe just artistic experimentation, you might find this kind of the limo and other things like that, or the kind of political side of things, and you can really use it for lots of, in lots of different ways and different genres. So that would be kind of, people would look at that, that other people's doing, oh, here, here are these very creative things that you can do with sequential images and text. Uh, and then other people look at that and go, well, I could do things with that too. Uh, and I could do other types of things. And so you might end up with then uh, a diversification of, of topics as people are realizing both that they can do more with this, as well as that there might be a demand for this, given the, uh, the commercialization aspect of it. That people are desiring and, and enjoying reading these things and would like to do it more, especially as it's a uh, uh, not overly expensive form of entertainment uh, uh, that is wrapped up often with the newspapers, right? So uh, it was a big draw for newspapers to be able to do this. So uh, uh, certainly I can see newspapers more saying, well, hey, we have these other ones that are very popular, and this is a very popular feature of our publications. Why not diversify this uh, to get more readership of different types because it will sell more newspapers? It, it, okay, Going yeah. back to the 20s, I don't, I don't want to belittle the 20s because uh, I think one of the significant things that came out of the 20s were, were the uh, women's uh, strips. Today, they would be put down as uh, you know, uh, uh, not good strips. But they did start including women, and these women were no longer just in the kitchen. You know, in the Cats and Jammer Kids, the mother was always in the kitchen, yeah. uh, and in others like that too. But by the 1920s, you're getting strips called Tilly the Toiler, uh, meaning yeah. that she's now working out of the house, and there are many others like that. Now, many of them certainly did not put women in a good uh, good uh, perspective. Uh, there was one called Dom Dora and, and things of that sort that certainly didn't help women's causes. But at least the women were getting out of the kitchen in the 1920s in the comic strips. Uh, they were working as secretaries. Some were models. You know, the, these types of... Well, so didn't, a, didn't a, even Blondie start out as a jazz flapper in her strip? Uh, yeah. Um, let me uh, talk about uh, something that seems to have faded away but was popular during the Great Depression, and that seems to be family-oriented comic strips. And I'm thinking about things like Little Abner or Gasoline Alley. Uh, and if you look today, and most w there are still strips in uh, on uh, printed paper, but a lot of now strips or, or sequential art, if you want to call it, has sort of migrated to the Internet. And it always seems to be either the gag or sort of, sort of, uh, you know, sarcastic uh, political humor. But in the 1930s, I mean, Little Abner had a huge effect. I mean, Sadie Hawkins' day, we still remember. Um, I think the the idea of the shmoo. I think the shmoo was uh, wasn't that originally on uh, Little Abner. And Gasoline Alley 
the, was, I think, fairly unique, and I could be wrong, in that the characters age chronologically, you know, at, they yeah. would grow. Uh, if he, let me start with you, John. Can you talk about those two strips and any other strips like that that were popular that have seemed to have just gone away now? Well, yeah, uh, Lil Wagner. Uh, I think I think Lil Wagner was a classic comic, was certainly an enjoyable one. Uh, today, probably would not be politically correct uh, because of, you know it, it certainly uh, with the people of the hill country, uh, oftentimes in a negative uh, perspective, but I thought it was uh, very well done, uh, and, you know, it, it had an impact, as you say, with Sadie Hawkins Day and uh, numerous other uh, things that have carried on to, to the present day. Um, Gasoline Alley, I, I never followed that very much, but you're right, you was a strip where the characters aged uh, as they went along, and uh, is that still going, Gasoline Alley? I don't know. I don't know if it's still published now or not. But, uh, but over the years, there were there were others of those too. The family strip certainly Blondie was a, became a family strip, yeah. and. Uh, We've had some in recent years too. I I would say that Calvin and Hobbes was sort of a family strip. Richard Thompson's cold de sac was partly a family strip. Uh, Richard just died a few months ago. That strip was uh, was excellent. So there are a few left, but not as they were before. And again, I think that's another interesting study to be done. Why, why this is so. Yeah. Uh, it could be that we don't act as families the same way as people act as families before. You know, Blondie and her family sat at the dinner table together and ate. Well, I don't know how many families still do that today. You know, they're watching television, doing other types of things while they're eating. Um, so, yeah, it's... They definitely were, were uh, important strips for talking about family, family values, family problems. Uh, Neil, your comments about family strips? Uh, well, I think that there uh, we might be discounting to some degree uh, strips about families because I can think of several right now that uh, are contemporary ones. For example, uh, for better or for worse, uh, has, is one that characters age as the strip progresses and has been going on for several decades. Uh, there's also Jumpstart, which is a family strip essentially, uh, where again people age and uh, you know characters have babies and those babies age into children and uh, you have this kind of family unit still. Uh, so I, I would say that there are, are still family strips that are out there, but in general, you know, the bar is higher to get strips to be published anyways, and so. Uh, it's, it's, you're going to have more diverse types of things because simply uh, it's, hard, it's harder to get strips to be public. And so you're going to have a diverse uh, types of different types of strips anyways. And uh, there's only so many, so many, so much room for, you know, family strips to occupy the newspaper uh, in today's day and age. Uh, so there's, you know, a couple family strips and there's a couple of different types of strips. And, uh, you have different ones fulfilling different purposes, but, but I think we still have that genre around uh, to some degree, at least. Do you think it's more difficult because people have to read sort of every strip to keep up with the the ongoing tale? Whereas if you have something like, say, The Far Side, which is very popular, Gary Larson's thing, it's just one or maybe occasionally two or three panels, and it's 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 a gag, maybe a brilliant gag, but. Uh, you, you know, you don't have to, you can just w read that one thing and th come back three weeks later. Well, I think uh, if an author is good, they're going to be able to make it so that a casual reader can understand individual strips, but a, uh, a more frequent reader is going to be able to get something uh, episodic about it. In addition to that, I think that if they're really good, you'll be able to read an individual one, enjoy it, and then want to engage into the episode aspect of it as well. Uh, so, uh, 
uh, I would think that at least the authors should, are, are trying to make it such that you uh, uh, can can follow along to some degree, at least if you I have, you know, have never read it before, because otherwise you'd never get new readers. You only keep the ones that you had before. So each individual strip has to have some degree of uh, standing alone. Yeah. Um, uh, it was mentioned about uh, uh, women comic strips early in the 20s and whatnot. I remember when I was a boy, one of the strips that was still going at the time was Mary Worth, which was uh, had a, a female protagonist. That, as I recall, that was more or less uh, a, a comic soap opera. And then there was something like Mark Trail, which was sort of like... Uh, set in the West and more, I guess, early ecologically based. Those kinds of strips also seem to have sort of faded from the scene as far as I know as a layman. Am I correct in that? Or are there still strips like that going? I think Mark Troll, I think he's, I think that strip's still going. It is? Okay. Yeah, I think so. But I'm not sure. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know that I can answer that. Uh, whether they are a thing of the past or they're still, or, or if they're maybe coming out in uh, different versions. I suspect some of this is online now. I haven't been following what's online. Mm -hmm. There certainly uh, uh, are women creators who have done quite well and have created some very great popular strips. I'm thinking of even just like Kathy, which has been around for quite a long time. Uh, others uh, and there's some you know very brilliant strips online that are done by women as well um, I think that uh, on online comics web comics really make uh, publishing much easier so there's less of a, less boundaries between authors and their readers uh, so I think there's a lot of you know emerging women web comics that are probably very good and, and you know, a lot of diversity there well, I want to end this first segment getting us up to basically about the end of World War II, uh, mid-century, 20th century. And I have to mention at least one of the comics that's usually on the top 10 list of all-time comics that I haven't spoken of yet, and that's Pogo. Um, and Pogo, in a sense, was, I always looked at it as a child, almost being sort of the animal equivalent of little Abner is that it's set sort of in the rural backwaters of some place, uh, and the characters are, but yet it also, it, it wasn't as outrageous, uh, over the top as a uh, little Abner could be. And years later, when I discovered crazy cat, I could, you could see a, a deeper, more, I guess you call literary bent to something like Pogo. Uh, maybe let me just ask John first, uh, can you just, uh, for uh, viewers who may not have ever heard of Pogo, tell a little bit about that and why it's considered such a, a cornerstone of uh, American comic strips? Well, Pogo was done by Walt Kelly. He started out, uh, if I'm not mistaken, doing uh, comics for Disney in the early 40s, I guess, and then later started the strip. This strip, in my eyes, was a classic because it was uh, definitely political and social satire. There was, you know, uh, it, it was there. It was, you know, for instance, during the McCarthy years, he had that character named uh, McClarkey. What was it? Malarkey. Yeah, yeah Malarkey. Uh, he had a number of characters like that that were uh, making fun of what was going on in the social and political uh, dimensions. Uh, of course, uh, he ran he ran Pogo for president on a couple of occasions. Uh, Pogo for president, I think, in '52, and maybe a couple more times. So it was definitely making. Like, I wish Pogo were around now after Trump's in. I, that would be fantastic to have a Pogo now because uh, I would like to see what Walt Kelly would do with what's happening now in, in politics. Um, but it was also. Uh, it was a genius also in the sense that he had so many different characters and he had so many different voices. So these characters were speaking in different dialects uh, and also the text, the lettering was done in such way to show that this was, a, you know, that it was 
something, an old thinking, an old plan or something of that sort. I don't know if you, you remember the text, but he would have it in different types of uh, font uh, that, uh, that brought in other types of messages. It was a genius piece of work that he was doing at that time. Uh, Neil, do you have comments about uh, Pogo and Walt Kelly? Uh, nothing that John has already covered. I think that was a pretty nice summary. Well, let's end this first segment, uh, and uh, when we return, let's talk about comic strips from the midpoint of the 20th century on to today, and we'll do that in a moment. I'm speaking with Neil Cohn and John Lent about the history of comic strips, uh, and we're focusing mainly on uh, the American side. Um, well, let me just ask, uh, before we move on with American comic strips from the mid-20th century, uh, were there any developments uh, outside of uh, America, uh, say in Europe or Latin America or, or the Far East, uh, that contributed in any way? Because I know in... The, after World War II, foreign film cinema started becoming big in the U.S. Was there any similar sort of influx or influence of, of comic strips after World War II on the American form from outside? John? I, I suspect there were, but I can't think of them. Um, there probably was some French influence on, on the comic strips. Um, but I think most of the influence was the other way, uh, mm -hmm. from the United States to other parts of the world. Um, I, I, I have, for instance, what, what we see in a lot of countries are imitations of American comic strips. The early Philippine uh, comic strips, for instance, were definitely copies with their own char characters of uh, Popeye and many of those strips of the 30s and 40s and beyond. So I think it was uh, more of that type of influence from the United States outward than uh, the other direction. There, was, there were also strips in South America that were, uh, were you know, using the prototype of the American strips. But I can't think of, uh, of any outside influences directly in the 1950s or 60s, but that doesn't mean that they didn't exist. I just don't remember them. I was thinking of specifically Tintin. I, I don't know when Tintin had started. Uh, uh, I think it was in Belgium or, or France that uh, Tintin came from. Uh, did, did that have any influence, or was that mainly just confined to Europe, John? I, I don't know that Americans knew about Tintin. Uh, I don't think Americans knew about comic strips anywhere in the world except the ones we had here. Mm -hmm. And that may be the case today, but it's much better now than, than it was before. So maybe, uh, you know, I, I don't know whether some of the people who used, used the clear line approach that Herge used, um, some of them in the United States, I don't know if they did that on their own or they were influenced by her Jay's work. Uh, but we had people in this country too doing the, the clear lines about detailed backgrounds and stuff that you had seen earlier in the 20s and 30s. Yeah. So, so there may have been, been some influence. Yes. Neil, do you have any comment on that before we move on? Uh, I, I, I think, uh, like John, I can't think of any specific instances of, of things that are cited as being very influential from uh, abroad on American comics, uh, or even uh, some of the reverse. I think that today people are at least somewhat more aware of global uh, comics, uh, but my suspicion is that of the ones that uh, people are aware of, uh, it's much more in the book realm than the strip realm. I would say that uh, comic books from abroad uh, in the U.S. are and, and permeating across the world. So. Uh, Asia or European uh, uh, presence of American comics and in America the Japanese manga or Bande Sine or things like that uh, I think are much more in the book format that people are aware of rather than in the strips. So I know, for example, many different book formatted uh, comics 
uh, from all over the world. But I, thinking about it, I, I don't know quite as many scripts uh, from around the world as I do do uh, large book formats. It's mm -hmm. much more uh, uh, restricted, I think, to, to locality. And one of the reasons for that, I would guess, is uh, this issue of uh, political commentary or social commentary. Uh, that strips often have, even subtly, so like Pogo, for example, uh, uh, has this subtle sort of politics in it. Uh, uh, and that might be much more culturally con confined, that you would not have as entertaining a strip if it's making some very subtle political statements uh, if it's abroad. Well, let me uh, talk about the 1950s because... Uh, again, as a layman, it seems to me that in the 1950s, there seemed to be a resurgence of comic strips focused uh, on children, but in a more sophisticated manner than had previously been with, say, the Cats and Jamma Kids. And I'm thinking of three comics specifically. One was Dennis the Menace, which was more the, a, a typical family strip with the, the problem child. The second was Dondi, which started out as this immigrant child from post-war Italy, although they revised him or retconned, as they say, his origins many times over the decades that that ran. But uh, that was more realistic. It was more sort of the adventures of a kid. And then, of course, Peanuts, uh, which started, I believe, in 1950, Charles Schultz. Uh, and I know, having looked at some of the, from when, as a child, I had the old uh, paperback books of some of the early uh, comic strips of the Peanuts. And they were far more darker and more existential than the Charlie Brown we got to know, say, from the mid-60s and the first TV special on. Um, let me start with John. Uh, can you talk about the 1950s? Am I correct in assuming that there was a different approach to comics in the way they regarded children in the 50s overall? Yeah, I think so. And I think the, the format or the, the style of the... Uh, drawing of the comics uh, changed because uh, uh, Peanuts was not, you know, an elaborate type yeah. of strip. It didn't have elaborate backgrounds, etc. Uh, but it was so. Uh, it was there was a lot of philosophy in in Peanuts. Uh, uh, there was religion in Peanuts. There were, there were a number of things that Charles Schultz purposely put into Peanuts and. I think at that time, it was a more thought-provoking strip, you know, with yeah. different characters and all that sort of thing. I think the different characters represented, a, some of them represented different uh, philosophical and psychological perspectives. Uh, certainly Lucy did, and, and uh, you know, the, taking the football and moving it at, at the times that she would, and, uh, you know, those that type of thing, and I think maybe later on, um, I don't know why, but perhaps some of this went, be, went over people's heads, or I think they were looking for something uh, simpler. Um, you know, the, uh, no, I, I don't know, I don't really know the answer to that, but uh, it, they were different, there's no doubt they were different. Do you think that the early, because when I, I said, there seemed to be a sharp divide with the early Peanuts, say the first 10 years, uh, not only in the drawing style, the, the, the characters were not quite as drawn as, I guess, cuddly as they later became. Snoopy was a thin, raggedy looking dog. Charlie Brown's head wasn't as big as it became. Um, and it seemed to be that as the, the visual style of Peanuts changed, so it did become warmer and fuzzy. Not that it became a bad comic strip, but it seemed to lose a little bit of its edge. I don't know why, but it might be merchandising. You know, they were definitely into merchandising. The scraggly uh, uh, <laughs> Snoopy might not sell as much as a fuzzy one. Yeah. Well, I think, um, so I, I actually have done a lot with Peanuts because uh, I actually use Peanuts in experiments that I do. So I, 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 I'm very intimate with the styles of Peanuts. And what you end up noticing, it's not a sharp change in the style whatsoever. It's a very gradual, uh, incremental change as his drawings uh, shifted. And I think you find that with most comic creators is that uh, as they when they begin a strip, it's you know still fairly rudimentary. They have a particular drawing style, 
and they the the way in which they draw becomes more and more systematic in the patterning. So uh, characters have you know particular schematic ways in which they're drawn, and when you draw that same schematic way over and over and over and over again, uh, it's going to take on different properties. Uh, one of the characteristics of language and communication in general is that as things become uh, schematized and repeated, they become much more systematic. Uh, so uh, that systematicity is then going to spill over and become you know, easier and easier and easier. If you think about uh, uh, just it's going to become more simplified and it's going to be you know much more uh, codified in the way it works. And and from that, it's going to just slowly shift as he's kind of settling into a consistent representation. So that if you look at, say, you know, late peanuts versus very early peanuts in the 50s, the representations have some similarity to each other. You can at least have some recognition of which characters are which. But the actual line work is going to be very different. different. But that uh, difference is not uh, discrete. So if you look over time, it's a very gradual shift that you get uh, from one representation to another. So I think uh, he wasn't doing it consciously necessarily. Mm -hmm. It's just part of the way in which uh, styles change over time. And you can look at that also with most all long running strips. If you look back at the very beginning, early ones, yeah. the representations look very different than the later ones. Think of like Garfield, for example. Yeah. You know, he started off really looking like this kind of blobby fat cat. And now he's this very cartoony, you know, he's supposed to be a fat cat, but he doesn't really look all that fat. He just kind of has a round tummy these days. Yeah. Um, so it's a little less, um, uh, like, you end up having this change over time that happens to the stuff. It happened with Calvin and Hobbes also. It happened to, to most any of these long-running strips. And Peanuts is very distinct, both because it's, you know, one of the longest-running strips done by a single person. Yeah. Uh, it's so salient in American consciousness as being such a, a wonderful strip, uh, and it's you know so very prominent. And uh, what the cartoon style was that became very popularized was not necessarily the way it began. For even the first ten to twelve years, it had a shifting style that didn't look exactly like the way it ended up. Yeah. Uh, much later. Now look, there, there's continuity there, but it, it does look different. Yeah, I know. I've seen the very earliest strips, for example, of Bloom County and Opus the Penguin doesn't look like he ended up. Uh, uh, but let me just digress for a moment before we move on to the 1960s, because you had mentioned that you do experiments. And for people that don't know, I'll link to both John's uh, web page, uh, uh, which is uh, temple.edu. Uh, well, I, I, yeah, I'll link to John's page. I can't I can't pronounce it. But then... Uh, uh, we have the visual language lab, uh, dot com, which is Neil's uh, page. When you talk about uh, uh, visual language lab, let me just, as I say, digress here. What what aspects do you study? And when you teach your students, do you take apart a comic strip, say organically, and, and then try to reassemble it the way you know someone teaching shop uh, with a car might do? <laughs> uh, to some degree, at least. Um. The way I would say I take it apart is more the way a linguist would take apart languages. Mm -hmm. So I detail the kind of internal structures and properties that are involved with understanding both individual images. So uh, what patterns are there that are found in individual images? And in fact, that's something uh, Peanuts has been studied quite a lot. So uh, there's been actually some old French uh, uh, papers looking at the specific schematic shapes that go into identification of peanuts characters mm -hmm. uh, and in more recent work i have a colleague here who i'm doing machine learning with where we're doing machine learning to see how uh, computers can understand uh, teasing apart how it is the the style of different comics works specifically in this case uh, peanuts because that's one of the things we work on uh, we also do work on you know how what are the structures by which people's uh, brains are able to understand a sequence of images. So in that case, uh, you know, what are the meaningful component parts of images? How do those parts contribute towards narrative structures? How do, how do those structures combine with each other? And what is it that happens in the human brain to allow you to do that? So we actually do show people Peanuts comic strips 
and uh, have electrode caps on their head and measure their brain waves. Okay. Uh, to what we do very specific manipulations to uh, these comic strips uh, with scientific, you know, manipulations. We don't just kind of say, sit here and read a bunch of comics and we'll see what happens. Mm. It's very controlled experiments for specific hypotheses. Well, I know with uh, language, when we when you can take apart a poem, you can say, well, this is poorly and jammed, the, the break of a line, or this is a cliche, a cliche being a familiar word or image or uh, or a, a metaphor used in a familiar place. When you break apart comic strips, uh, I mean, and, and also like in visual medium, there are visual cliches in films when you see, for example, uh, the hero has done something, and then there's a zoom close up onto the face for his reaction, you know, to show that he's manly or whatnot. Uh, do you do that also in comic strips? Say, well, here, here's a, a, a typical trope, but look how, how this comic, say say a, a rather generic comic, I think like High and Lois versus say Peanuts in its heyday or Calvin and Hobbes. And do you sort of break down and say, well, notice how the Calvin and Hobbes strip tackles this similar subject, but in a far more unique way than say High and Lois might have. I mean, do you break things down critically as well? Um. Well, I think in the, the breaking things down critically in a very literary way, there are certainly many people who do that. Um, mm -hmm. They will analyze the kind of literary qualities and the formalistic qualities that go into those sorts of uh, literary analyses. My work is more at the level of linguistics rather than literary analysis. So linguistics would say something like, how is it that you break apart a sentence into nouns and verbs and adjectives, and how do those relate to each other to make groupings? Uh, and phrases, and those phrases build larger groupings, and things like that. Simply, at the very basic level of how is it that you understand a sentence, mm -hmm. rather than what is that sentence doing artistically, just how is it that your brain is able to understand a sequence of sounds and convert them into meaningful sounds, and convert those meaningful sounds into a meaningful sequence. That's a very basic problem. Uh, so I do the same sorts of things with images, which is, how is it that you can look at lines on paper or lines on a screen, first of all, know that they're meaningful, and then be able to take those meanings, make a compositional meaning out of them, and then combine a series of them into a sequence of meaningful graphic images. We can't take it for granted just that the brain somehow magically does it. The, brain has to have various mechanisms that allow you to understand a sequence of images. So mm. I'm interested in very basic processes like that. Okay. Yeah. Now, I have done analysis of breaking down the structures of uh, peanut strips and Calvin and Hobbes and comic books and lots of other uh, sorts of works using the analysis tools that I've developed where you can see, wow, there's a really rich structure here that they're using uh, and uh, you can recognize the sorts of you know creative things. And with these tools, I think you can if one could go in and, and analyze these things and say, oh, look, well, this strip, which we think of as being a little bit less complicated, maybe is using simpler underlying structures uh, in its kind of grammatical structure, I would say, uh, or its visual language structure, than a Calvin and Hobbes or Peanuts, which might be using much more you know, complicated or somewhat uh, experimental aspects of uh, the, the mechanisms by which you understand sequences of images. So certainly my, my approach allows for that. We've done some of those analyses, but um, my personal work is more on the basic science part than the literary aspects of it, okay. which there are many comic studies, people who do that literary work, which is also quite interesting. Yeah, I interviewed a fellow about a year and a half ago who has an organization called Sequart named Julian Darius. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but uh, uh, he, he's also he publishes a lot of monographs about uh, mostly comic books, I believe, rather than strips. But nonetheless, uh, let, let me get back to the 1960s and 70s, because uh, as a layman, I guess, when I think of my youth, it seems that the 60s and 70s, with the exception of maybe Doonesbury, seem to be sort of a lull, a rut uh, in comics history. I mean, you had a lot of strips like B.C., Hagar, handicapped, the aforementioned high and lowest that seemed to dominate a lot of the, the landscape. And like I said, you did have Doonesbury start in the late 60s. Uh, it, uh, but it seemed like the 1980s was when Calvin and Hobbes and, and uh, uh, the Far Side and Bloom County and these, again, now considered classic strips came along. Am I Was that sort of a fallow period, do you think, the 60s and 70s? Or am I wrong in reading it that way? <laughs> 
John? you Neil those comics I mentioned plus something like Beetle Bailey I know as a kid just reading them they seemed harmless inoffensive they, they there wasn't to me even as a child any excitement reading them uh, well there might be several factors there uh, certainly the climate about comics in the 60s had changed given the uh, the stuff about comic books and the kind of persecution of comic books earlier uh, so that might have spilled over to the realm of comic strips where they felt they had to be a little more innocuous uh, simply to maintain their their living. Uh, it might also be uh, kind of formatting changes. So uh, if uh, there's a shift in the way in which focus is happening within newspapers, uh, as opposed to, say, the early, early part of the, uh, the 20th century where Comics were a big draw of the newspapers. They were starting to become less so, and so they're being devoted less space to them, which means there's going to be, you know, uh, less room for more of them and more new ones. And you're going to stick with probably what's you know reliable, uh, and and you know want to go with what what's a, a safe bet for uh, making money through them in providing entertainment. Uh, there might also be uh, some factor of the rising uh, uh, prominence of, of comic books as well um, as a different type. So you might, you know, hypothetically, one could imagine that you have somebody who is really into drawing uh, comics and they decide, well, I can either go do strips where it's a harder sell to get into the industry maybe than it would be to get into doing comic books. And so maybe I'll go the comic book direction or the interests are simply different in that regard. So. Uh, those are different sort of uh, factors that can be involved. Uh, before I move on to the 1980s, I want to talk about the 1960s, uh, sort of the underside, what would be, I guess, considered uh, sort of underground uh, uh, strips. And I'm, I'm thinking of things, the more sexually explicit things like Fritz the Cat. And uh, who is the fellow who did the Keep on Trucking? They did a documentary of him 20 years ago. Um, uh, yeah, Crumb. Uh, the, the Robert Crumb... Uh, Fritz the Cat kind of underground, you know, stuff. You could even throw in things maybe like some of the early Mad comic stuff, Spy versus Spy. Uh, was this was there more fertile ground in these underground comics of the sixties and seventies than in the mainstream ones? John, you want to go? Not many of those were used in, in newspapers, though. Those were mainly comic books. Uh, okay. And if they were used in newspapers, they were used in underground newspapers. And, of course, in the 60s, there were a number of those. I was the editor of one in Wyoming, 
called the pre-lunch where they feed me to eat. And uh, we, uh, we, have, we, we used to get, get them through a, uh, I think it was called Liberation News Service. We get these underground comics and sometimes we would use them. Um, yeah, but, but they, of course, uh, I don't know that they made that much of an impact on mainstream comics. No. They were mainly limited to the underground and to comic books. And if I might add in line with that, uh, about our previous discussion of, of kind of more innocuous, less uh, kind of edgy topics in the mainstream, uh, the underground comics may have been, you know, providing, filling that niche, right? So in response to the fairly innocuous works that were being done in comic strips and comic books, uh, you know, which were targeted toward more towards kids to some degree, at least, um, the underground said, well, we're going to fill the gap and, and aim towards much edgier topics, and they certainly were much edgier. Uh, and politically, you know, uh, targeted and things like that. So that might have filled like, an additional uh, gap there that wasn't uh, being satisfied by the mainstream. Well, John mentioned the article by Bill Waterson, who was created uh, Calvin and Hobbes. And as I had said, it seemed that the 1980s saw a return to... I guess complexity, literary techniques, and the three the three comics that, in my mind at least, stood out uh, from the papers I was reading in the '80s were Gary Larson's Far Side, uh, Burke Breathe's uh, Bloom County slash uh, Outlands, and I think it had a, one other title, uh, uh, and then of course Calvin and Hogg by Bill Waterson. Uh, are these sort of was this almost? considered like the, sort of the three pillars of maybe a comic renaissance because that's what it seemed like and when you when you even today you can still find in Barnes and Nobles you can still find uh, collections of those classic comics of the 80s John do you want to comment yeah I, I think uh, I think I think they did I, I think that uh, uh, they introduced another dimension that, that was uh, uh, more socially and politically uh, uh, relevant. Uh, I'm, I'm a little stuck here, but uh, maybe Neil can move on. Neil? Yeah, uh, I, I would agree. I mean, certainly those ones seem to be the most prominent. Uh, I, I, obviously, there are many other great comics from the 80s as well. Uh, I, again, I'm a little hard pressed to remember specifics, and that's partially because maybe the significance of the ones you mentioned. Um, and it was also, you know, a big deal when those ones stopped, uh, which is also a sign of their, you know, importance and prominence for that period uh, relative to others, certainly. Uh, and, and, and I think uh, just to add to that, one of the, uh, uh, the reasons why it was maybe a a big deal when they stopped was because they kind of went out on top, yeah. as it were. Uh, they didn't just kind of continue on and, you know, you know, as wonderful as Peanuts is, some of the older Peanuts, it did get, you know, a little less edgy, a little less humorous. Yeah. You read back the old Peanuts, even now, a lot of those old Peanuts are pretty hilarious. Uh, but, you know, some of the later ones are a little more weird and contemplative and uh, you're a little bit wondering what they're about all the time. Um, but no, that never happened with Farside or Calvin Hobbes because they went out, you know, on top. So you only have good memories of them uh, because they were so prominent, so great at that time. They never, you know, came down off the mountain. They went out, they hit their high and went out. Yeah. I, I think what was yeah. significant that most of these uh, great ones that we're talking about now uh, also were discontinued after the creator either died or, uh, or gave them up. And I think that's an important point because there have been so many comic strips that dragged on, you know, for decades after the creator yeah. started.
Yeah, and it, it, uh, you mentioned uh, someone, it was either you or, or Neil had mentioned that uh, about the commercialization. I know that I think, I think I read somewhere that Bill Waterson had been very critical of Schultz's last 20 or so years of Peanuts because of that very commercialization, you know, having Charlie Brown at Disneyland or whatever theme park it may have been. And uh, I think as far as I know, Waterson has only authorized the re-release of his comics in a book form. I don't think there are any uh, uh, Hobbes stuffed Hobbes animals. No, yeah, no, no shirts, no mugs, no stickers. You will see people selling Calvin and Hobbes shirts and stickers and things like that, but they're all unauthorized and he doesn't make any money out of them. So they're all essentially pirates. Yeah. Any, any, any merchandise you see of Calvin and Hobbes that isn't the books is essentially pirated and in, in, in is uh, is not at all uh, making any money for Bill Watterson or is reflected of his wishes. He he did not want there to be any merchandising whatsoever of his works. Let's let's talk about the the turn of the century uh, and to where we are now because uh, it seemed uh, to me that if there have been uh, great comics, they probably are on the web. I mean, the last comic I read with any regularity was, uh, oh, I, I can't even remember the name. It, there was a, uh, it was a, like a young sassy black kid with a big afro who was always sort of zinging, making political comments. Do you know uh, what? what? There, my brother's were. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, that may have been it. Um, uh, so have has the internet become the home of, comic strips and do people flock to read uh, an internet strip the way they once did you know the daily strips in the papers or is the medium really in flux perhaps in, in risk of maybe just sort of fading away um, let me start well, with neil yeah well i would say it's actually hardly fading away at all i think it's yeah. become much more rich even yeah. because of the web. Uh, that the web enables you know people to publish on their so self-publish essentially, uh, so they, they're not necessarily beholden to syndicates and to outlets such as newspapers. They just have to, you know, make you aware of what they're doing. Uh, you know, so you have to you have to find them somehow. But once you do, uh, you can get it straight to your computer every morning. So uh, there are several strips that I read on a daily basis uh, that are only web comics that may not be published anywhere else. Well, name uh, them. Someone, name name your two or three best ones that you follow. Uh, well, as an academic, I follow PhD Comics by Jorge Cham, which is hilarious. It's all about academia and science. Uh, so PhD Comics, it's, that's really great. Uh, Savage Chickens by Dan Savage, I really enjoy. Uh, that one is, has a lot of playful, absurdist sort of things. He plays a lot with uh, 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 language and the structure of comics also. And, and is that uh, the same uh, Dan Savage who was the... the uh, I don't believe so. I, I might be getting the name wrong, but it is Savage Chickens, and the gentleman's name is last name is Savage. Okay. Um, uh, I might be confusing which Savage it is, but his last name is Savage, and I do greatly enjoy it. Um, let me make sure here. Because um, I know Dan Savage was the goss, not the goss, the advice columnist for like uh, a lot of. There's, there's a Dan Savage who was advice columnist. Definitely not that. That's a. discovered at the San Diego Comic International, uh, who's hilarious. I, I haven't seen a single strip of his that I haven't liked, and his name is Lonnie Millsap. Um, and it is really, really funny stuff. It reminds me very much of uh, The Far Side, uh, in that same sort of vein of humor. A little bit of the drawing style is kind of close, but not, not entirely. Um, but it is really, really funny stuff. So I would say, you know, Lonnie Millsap, Savage Chickens, and PhD Comics are ones that I read every day okay. uh, because they're pretty great. And I don't think uh, I would know about them if it weren't for the web also. Okay. Uh, uh, John, so, okay. Yeah. John, do you, uh, do you follow modern comics or are you more looking back with a historian's eye? I don't follow the, the modern comics, but I do uh, follow what's happening in other countries. And for instance, the question was, you know, relating to whether the comics are dying out or is the internet keeping them alive, a good case study is Korea, South Korea, because the South Korean 
have some very successful online comic strips. And there's a difference between a strip that starts out on paper and then goes to to the internet. In the case of the Korean ones, they start out on the on the internet. Mm -hmm. They're called webtoons, and they became very popular. Uh, some of them so popular that then they were published into books. Uh, a couple of the books sold over a million copies. Others were made into TV series and movies. Now these were not done by established cartoonists. These were people who were just messing around with the computer and and you know doing these these strips. The early early ones of those were rather uh, disgusting. I mean, they, 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 they were taken. They were doing things that were scatological. They were doing things that were uh, you know picking nose and stuff like that that uh, just to shock people. But others have now become very popular because of their stories and we're seeing other types of uh, strips like that uh, in singapore there's one that well it's now been banned by the government and cartoonists had to apologize but this cartoonist started it online it was called instead of democratic singapore it was called democratic singapore and of course they were making fun or he was making fun of some of the leaders of Singapore, which is is uh, off limits in Singapore. So yeah, a, there are a number of these in other countries now that that uh, I think we should also look at because so often when we think about comic strips and comic books, we only think about the United States. And there's a very rich. Uh, uh, history of comic books and comic strips in other parts of the world and not just in Europe. So, for instance, the first graphic novel we, we talk about in this country, but in Indonesia in 1964, they had a, a comic book that called itself a graphic novel and, uh, and treated itself as a graphic novel. Um, anyway, Neil. that's what's up. Oh, I just want to issue my correction about the uh, author of Savage Chickens is Doug Savage, not okay. Dan. Doug Savage. And, and I'll just reiterate that I think uh, very much so. You know, certainly public publishing has changed because of the internet. And newspapers as a, uh, uh, as a publishing format have changed. Uh, and the space for comic strips within them. Uh, so the web has enabled a different sort of publishing platform that has kind of democratized things and made it far more uh, accessible for anybody to do. So now there isn't sort of quite the bar of you know getting picked up by a syndicate or something like that. You can just post whatever you do online, and whoever likes it will read it uh, mm -hmm. and like it. And that has enabled, I think, both uh, a democratization of publication uh, and a, a a wide range of creativity. So you might have lots of different types of topics able to be done that were not being done as much before. In the same way that we talked about previously, that the 30s saw this kind of boom of different genres, I think the web has then allowed there to be this additional boom of genres because there's no restrictions whatsoever on who, you know, what people can do. So people just end up doing whatever it is they enjoy creating about and they find Hopefully, they find the readership via the types of people who like to read those things will eventually find their work online. So it ends up being uh, less of a you know superstar format. Although there certainly are those things, such as like PvP uh, or something like uh, like these video game inspired comics, which have you know maybe even millions of readers. Um, I don't I don't know the numbers, but I know that they can be very popular. Uh, at the same time, you can have somebody who just you know really enjoys drawing comics on post-it notes and then uploading it onto their computer, and they have maybe a hundred readers. But they have those hundred readers, and they will continue doing it because they enjoy doing it because they can find an audience that way. So you find you know all sorts of different things on on the internet if you look around for them. So I think there have been there are more comic strips now than there ever have been. It's just. It's a different type of format, and it's a different sort of uh, publication venue. Well, in the closing segment, I want to give you both final thoughts, but I want to f end this segment with one final question that sort of combines both uh, John's expertise on uh, 
uh, non-U.S. comics and yours with language. And that is, since comics are going online, they're going to be more international readers of comics uh, wherever they're based from and wherever those readers may be. Uh, does history suggest what type of comic strip may be most successful on a broad sphere, i.e., have, say, American comics that have gone abroad that have been successful, have they translated well? Because with language, like in poetry especially, it's very critical to have a good translation. It's not quite as critical in prose, but are comics that are, say, more visually based in their humor or their storytelling, do they translate better across you know, different languages? Or can the subtleties of, say, a Calvin and Hobbes or or a, a Bloom County, or the immediacy of the political moment of a Doonesbury, do they do they travel better? Let me ask both of you, John, and then Neil. John. Well, uh, I think I think the American comics usually are in the English English language papers of those countries. I was in Bangladesh last week, and uh, in Bangladesh they had they had. Uh, as far as I could see, no local comic strips. Uh, they had one manga, a continuing manga, it's a panel every day in one English paper, it was in English. And then they had Garfield, uh, I think Peanuts. They had three strips, they were all American, they were all in English. So I don't think they translate well. I, I, uh, yeah, I, I don't think. I think most times they're in the English language presses of those countries. Uh, your thoughts, Neil, on translations of comics? Um, well, I think that there, well, first of all, I should say there's a very large uh, literature on translating of comics uh, and the challenges that pose that it poses for various reasons. Um, we have a paper coming out, for example, on just onomatopoeia in American and Japanese books. There was a analysis, a corpus analysis of looking at these things, and we find very subtle differences between, say, boys and girls comics in Japan and the way that they do onomatopoeia in ways that would be virtually untranslatable because of the use of different types of scripts, for example. Um, so there are inherent challenges to translation issues oftentimes. Uh, whether physical humor might be better, sometimes it does, it can be. And I, uh, but again, I think that in a lot of cases, some works are being spread around and others aren't. So uh, here in the Netherlands, for example, um, uh, there are many people who do know Peanuts, um, but not that many new Calvin and Hobbes. For example, I have a colleague who studies comics, is really into comics, had never known of Calvin and Hobbes until I raised them, and now he loves them. But didn't even know about them until I mentioned them recently. Uh, he's an older gentleman, and, and so it, you know, one would think that he would have heard of them before. Uh, but apparently, it's not big in the Netherlands. I actually one time uh, had a whole class where we talked a lot about Calvin and Hobbes because of some of the creative things that they do in it that uh, Watterson does in it. And my students really didn't know this trip at all. So I basically said, "Here's an additional homework assignment: go home and look up on the internet Calvin and Hobbes and go read a bunch of their scripts." So. Even Calvin Hobbes, which is such a celebrated uh, trip in, in America, is not known, you know, worldwide it, as you know the you know shining great example that we think about it in, in America. Like in here in the Netherlands, where basically everybody is, you know, a bilingual in both Dutch and English. Like everybody speaks English here, and yet they didn't know this strip that was published in English that was you know huge in America. So. Uh, I, I would guess that in other parts of the world, you know, it's, it is you know not as prevalent to have translated strips be uh, uh, spread around as much. Okay, well, let's uh, in in this seg oh, do you have something final to say, John? Okay, well, let's end this segment. In the final segment, uh, we'll just give uh, John and uh, Neil a final say so, and we'll do that in a moment. I've been speaking about the nature and history of comic strips with uh, John Lent and Neil Cohn, two experts on the history uh, of comics. Uh, uh, John has a, a page that I'll link to below this video uh, uh, at Temple, his university, and then the Visual Language Lab is Neil's 
uh, website. I'll link to that also below the video. Let me just give them both uh, a, a final thought or two. Uh, John, uh, are you uh, are you optimistic uh, about the future of comics uh, as well as uh, Neil uh, and any other final thoughts that you may have about the art form? Uh, yes, I'm optimistic. Uh, I don't think they'll they'll be uh, very dominant in the form that they have been in past, but I think as Neil has pointed out, uh, they have a future on, on the uh, internet. And we're seeing this now in, in this country, the United States, but we're seeing it elsewhere in the world. So, to me, I think there's a future for them. Uh, I think they'll also take other dimensions as the internet uh, provides more, different, more opportunities of uh, interactiveness and things of that sort will probably be, be uh, or, or is being incorporated already, and I think uh, you know you're, you're going to see the comic strips. It's just they'll be in a different format, different technology. Um, I see um, a, a revival of interest in comic strips in a number of other countries now. Uh, a revival that uh, had diminished by the late 1980s and 90s. And we're seeing some of that come back now. And again, a lot of it is online. So, yes, I'm optimistic. Neil, any final thoughts from you on uh, the medium? Sure. Well, as I said earlier, I think that the internet has made it so that more people are drawing comics than ever have before uh, in ways that are accessible to each other. So, certainly, I think, you know, lots of people have always drawn comics, but it's not necessarily the case that everybody saw each other's comics. And the internet has certainly made it possible for there to be, you know, a boom of uh, creators and topics and all sorts of different things that are done. So you have, you know, not only these sorts of, you know, genres that you think of, of like action or uh, soap operas or uh, satire or absurdism, but you also have things like science comics and comics about academia and some comics about, um, you know, all sorts of random niche things that you never would have seen in, in some sort of publication like uh, newspapers, simply because they wouldn't be what might cater to, you know, the masses, but they will cater to an audience, um, even if that audience is like, you know, one person who's making himself laugh. So um, that, I think, uh, yields, you know, a, a, a very widespread, um, accessibility and uh, growth of these sorts of uh, you know, snippets of graphic creations. And obviously, we're also seeing a, a huge boon in, in uh, you know, longer format works as well. Uh, so I think this is a, you know, maybe the richest time we've ever seen for this type of communication and, and uh, you know, using this sort of visual language of comics, as I call uh, these forms. Uh, and also accessibility across the world. That having uh, the internet means that if you, even if you are, you know, creating some sort of work in English, maybe other people around the world will be able to experience it also. So I think it's a very exciting time for comic strips and comic books, uh, given you know the internet and uh, how accessible these things are, and how uh, uh, accessible creating these things are for everybody. Well, I know uh, that my website has a few comics fans themselves, so I have to ask this final question because otherwise I'd catch a hell from it. So let me just ask John and then Neil. Uh, what is your all-time favorite personal comic, the comic that if you had to have a book stuck on a desert island to read, what is that personal comic? And do you have a comic that you think is the all-time best comic? Let me start with John. If, if they're one and the same, then what, what, what is your favorite and what do you think is the best, John? Choose just one. I would say Bogo would be one of them. I, I think also uh, Kelvin and Hobbes. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think those two would be. Okay. Uh, and I think the uh, the old Dick Tracy uh, oh. comic strips. I thought there was a lot of creativity in those. Yeah. But, uh, you know, just to come up with those characters was, was <laughs> a very good thing. Okay, and how about you, Neil? How about favorite and best, if you can name them, or if they're different? Well, I mean, I think, 
Apples and certainly Peanuts, uh, although it's such a massive you know, run that you know, some parts of it are better than others, obviously. Uh, I think that it's very hard to rival Calvin and Hobbes, both in its substance and its imagination. Uh, just the way that he you know, conveyed uh, not only just sort of like funny stuff, but all, a lot of it was very poignant yeah. and very uh, creatively done in, in ways that uh, you, you don't see quite as much imagination in other strips. And uh, case in point, I actually have a Calvin Hobbes comic strip hanging on my office wall that has been on my office wall uh, since I was a teenager. I've had like, the same strip hanging on my wall uh, for, you know, 20 something years. So um, I think it's pretty, it's pretty wonderful as the strip uh, goes. Uh, and it may be, I would, I would say it's certainly one of my favorites, if not my favorite, uh, and one of the best of all time, too. Well, Neil and John, thank you for your time and your expertise. Thank you for having me.